Today I'm going to be preaching on a topic that I've never preached on before, and it's one that I'm preaching on because a lot of people have asked me, and I realize it comes up again and again in the Christian community, should we be tithing? Like, what is, what's your position on this? And I thought, I've really, this obviously, this is a question a lot of people have, and I ought to, to give it some full attention and deal with it properly. And so today, we're going to be asking the question, what does the Bible say about giving in the New Covenant? Uh, is it supposed to be a tithe, which we normally consider 10%? If it's not tithing, then what is that? And so the way I'm going to try and approach that is, first of all, to talk about Old Testament tithing and say, so it's, we know exactly what it is that we're talking about, and then say, is tithing in the New Testament, and end by talking about what then is New, New Testament teaching on giving. So first of all, Old Testament tithing. Now, before we uh, actually look at the scripture, I want to I wanna come up with the term extreme tithing. And by this, I mean the way that it's pitched in some organizations, some, some denominations. And it's, it's like, you know, you give, it's the best investment you could have. God will give you back a hundredfold and, you know, give money to our church and we'll give you a receipt. And God, you know, and it's kind of, you're going to get by giving. Don't invest in, in, in the bank or in, in, in uh, uh, funds or anything like that. Um, it's pro guaranteed prosperity. It's part of the prosperity gospel. You will get, give to get. Put your money in this machine, not this machine. God's machine gives a higher reward. And then tacked onto that is if you don't give, Satan will have a legal right to devour your wealth. And you're, he's going to come and he's going to eat away at your wealth if you don't have that, if you don't do that. So you better be giving. And... Um, and uh, Part of that is saying 10% of your money belongs to God. Make sure he gets it. If you don't, it's his. If you don't give it to him, then you're in trouble. The other 90%, of course, is yours to spend on however you want to, because it's yours. Uh, and this is part of the model. And uh, uh, what, what um, is, a lot of the teaching is based on Malachi 3. So we're going to look at Malachi chapter 3 and see what it says. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the fields shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Well, you might say, that's, um, that's, um, looks, whoa, that looks pretty strong to me. Uh, what's kind of clear? What's going on there? So how are we going to answer this? Uh, it sounds pretty strong. Well, what we have to realize is that keeping the law was very closely linked to blessing in the land which belonged to God. There was a close link between the, la the promised land, which was God's possession, they're brought into it, and God owned that land, and the, tithe, the, 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 the tithe was part of that. And there's, a, there's some clear teaching that comes out of that idea which uh, uh, is linked into the tithing passages of Scripture. Tithing, and if you look at the Scriptures on tithing, it's actually the produce of the land. <clears throat> so it's not, it doesn't say, you know, tithe your wealth. It says, for all the land produces um, this much grain, that much grain belongs to God. If there are that many animals were born, those ones belong to God. So it's very tied to what the land produces. If you look at the tithing rules, and it's, it's here in the text as well. It's, it's food. Tithing is food that it's, it, it's based on. But um, also the land was to rest for seven years. They were actually to give the land complete rest, not plow or anything, because that year belonged to God. 
and they had to give a complete rest. Um, so <clears throat> the, the, the tithing, which on the surface sounds very strong, is very, very cl closely tied into the whole Old Testament rules and regulations about living in the land. When they're living in God's land, this is how they are to behave. And very, very detailed rules about tithing. <clears throat> Um, so we can argue then that it's tied in to the detail of the Old Covenant. Um, but we can go a lot further than that. The one thing that a lot of people don't realize, virtually none of them seem to, to, to know who are advocating tithing, tithing is there are actually three tithes. Um, one of them was, two of them were yearly and one was every three years. So around about 23%. Uh, the first tithe was for the feasts to cover your own food costs. And uh, the second tithe was to the Levites. And that was the one referred to in that passage in Malachi. And the third tithe was to be collected every three years and distributed to the poor and needy. Let's just show you these texts. Here's the first tithe. Each year you're to set aside a tenth of all the produce grown in your fields. You're to eat a tenth of your grain, new wine, and fresh oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to have his name dwell, which is Jerusalem, so that you will always learn to fear the Lord your God. In other words, this, all this food, the tenth, was to be saved up for feasting on during the feast. And there were actually three feasts during the year they were to um, use for having this tithe. It carries on. <clears throat> but if the distance is too great for you to carry it, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far away from you, in other words, you live too far to get to Jerusalem three times a year, and since you're, the, the Lord your God has blessed you, what do you do with your tithe? Here's this is a surprise. Then exchange it for silver, take the silver in your hand, and go to the place the Lord your God chooses, you may spend the silver on anything you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, beer, or anything you desire. You're to feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice with your family. So the tithe, which must be collected, it's a 10%, was to be spent on yourself having fun. Okay? Have you heard anyone advocate that today? But this is the law. I mean, it's not just this passage. This is very, this is spelt out. So this is the first 10%. Here's the second 10%, and I'm giving you a couple of references. Uh, we obligate ourselves to bring the fruit of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine, the oil, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And then the Levites then had to tie the tenth of that to God. The Lord instructed Moses, speak to the Levites and tell them, when you receive from the Israelites the tenth that I've given you as your inheritance, you are to present a part of it as an offering to the Lord, a tenth of the tenth. So that is the second tithe, which is to be given to the Levites. And they put it in the storehouse. And that pays for the whole priestly system, because the priests were part of the Levites. The third tithe, at the end of every three years, bring a tenth of all your produce for that year and store it within your city gates. And so they had places where this was stored. Uh, then the Levite, who's no portion inheritance among you. So these are different Levites. These are like Levites who are not attached to the system. Um, the resident alien, somebody who's uh, an, an immigrant, the fatherless, the widow within your city gates may come, eat, and be satisfied. So this is a social security system. This is a, a system provided, a food bank, yes, uh, provided for the um, uh, people to eat. But it was, it, it was stipulated that you had to give a tenth every three years for this. And the Lord your God will bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. So we have to understand that if we're going to advocate tithing, we need to be biblical and say exactly what it is, because it's actually 23% here. So that then is just a brief summary of the law in the Old Testament, Old Testament tithing. Let's move on then to ask, is tithing in the New Testament? Are there any references? Can anybody tell me if there's any references? Does the word tithe come up in the New Testament? Yeah? Okay, where? 
You're dead right. You're dead right. It one one reference. It's one reference, and it is in both Matthew and Luke identical. And uh, the reference is this: Jesus says, "Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin." Cumin. So what he's saying is, you know, you're supposed to to every, the produce of the land. You're supposed to get a tenth of it and give to God. Um, and they're even doing it to like mint, you know, a few sprigs of mint and they're cutting off a tenth. You know, even if it's one leaf, they'll cut a tenth of that, which is you know, ridiculously um, uh, preci- precise, missing the whole point. Uh, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. And then he says that these you ought to have done. In other words, I'm not saying you shouldn't tithe, without neglecting the others. So, um, this is the only reference, um, but people have said, well, this clearly Jesus is for tithing here because he doesn't condemn them for actually tithing, so this must mean tithing continues. Um, Well, the problem is that um, at this point, the old covenant law, the Old Testament law was still in effect and it was still in effect till Jesus died and put an end to the Old Covenant. And some people refer to um, Abraham paying a tithe before, the old, before Moses, therefore, you know, it predates Moses' law, so, you know, we're still under it. Um, but, you know, there are, there are a number of things that came to an end when Jesus died. And one of them, as, as well as there was, for example, um, circumcision wasn't required anymore, um, but particularly the animal sacrifices. Now, animal sacrifices predated Moses. They predated the Moses' law. They went right back to Abraham, in fact, right back to before the flood. And so you're going to say, well, you know, animal sacrifices are not part of the law, and Jesus still practiced them. I mean, Jesus kept the Passover sacrifice, didn't he? So Jesus must be for animal sacrifices, so we should still do them. Well, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? I think, hopefully, we'll all agree about that. So just because something happens occasionally before Moses and something Jesus participated in, it doesn't mean that it must be something we do today. No, what we need to do is to say, is this something which the New Testament church practiced, were encouraged to practice. And my main argument today uh, against being under tithing is that there there are a lot of places in the New Testament where we're urged to give generously. We're urged to give, and lots of reasons are there for giving. Not a single time is tithing even mentioned. Not a single time is it even mentioned in all of those. And so it's gone. Like it's gone from the scene, even though giving is very, very important. And so I would say, absence of tithing in the New Testament, there's lots of reasons for giving, but tithing is never there. We're never told to give because of a rule about how much. In fact, the opposite is true. And we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians in a minute, but uh, chapter 9, verse 7 says, each one must give as they have decided in their heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, but for God loves a cheerful giver. This is very clear in the New Testament. Giving must be free. It must be a free choice because that's what God loves. That's what God wants us to do. And so, um, so uh, this, is, this is the... Uh, I I would think the essence of the reasons why I don't believe that we are under tithing. Uh, Paul can conclude this verse here after two chapters of trying to motivate the Christians to give, uh, but he never even hints about tithing. Um, But God has given us some other principles about giving. It's not that there are no principles that are. There are some principles about giving, and this is what we're going to turn to now in the last part of today's message. We've looked at the Old Testament. We've looked at whether tithing is in the New Testament. Now, what is the New Testament's teaching on giving? And uh, I'm going to argue that the first major principle is that the 
who give to get prosperity uh, investment idea cannot be correct because fundamental teaching is, is Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. The Old Testament law was very much based on the earthly kingdom. Blessings now. You, keep, you look at the promises if you keep the law. They're all things now that you'll get. If you, if you keep the law, God will bless you. He'll keep you from your enemies. He'll do all these things. The new, the new covenant is we've got a kingdom that's coming. This is, this is like the, 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 the forerunning. Um, but soon we're going to be there in the eternal kingdom. That's where you need to lay up your your treasure. And so the idea, you know, you, you give 10% and God will give you this money back right now, then that's, that can't be right. So that's the first principle that we have to have. But the main thing I'm going to look at today is a big chunk on giving, two whole chapters in 2 Corinthians, where Paul is trying to motivate the Corinthians to give for a specific need he has. The need he has is that there's a there's going to be a famine in Jerusalem, it's prophesied, and they're, they're trying to take collections up right across the Mediterranean from the churches to support the people in this. And he's trying to motivate them to give for this. Um, all right, the last verse there. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Very important. So let's look then at Second Corinthians and verses 8 and 9. Uh, and so I'm just going to read you a few verses here and comment as I go through. <clears throat> so chapter 8, verse 1. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. Now, <clears throat> the word grace there is interesting. He's using this a lot in this passage. And it's literally, it's the same word. Uh, it's the word charis, which is the same word as we use for charismatic or charismata or spiritual gifts. And so it's God's gift to you that he's given, and he's given this gift. It's a gift of generosity. And he says, brothers and sisters, these churches in Macedonia have had this gift of generosity given to them. Oh, so God's given them a gift, but the gift is a gift of giving. And uh, so this is the gift that they've been given. And and so this is the, what it looks like, verse 2. In a severe, severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the privilege of taking part in the relief of the saints. So God has given us them this generosity that's so strong, they're actually giving more than they can really afford because they so want to give. And so Paul is motivating the, the Corinthians and saying, look, look at these other churches, what God has been doing with them. Verse 5, this, not as expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus, who'd been collecting the money there, that as he'd begun, so he should complete among you this act of grace. So you can see he's setting them up now. Look, this is what they've done. Titus is coming to you now. This was a grace, and this is the same word he ends there, grace. He, this, this act of grace, God gave them the gift. Are you going to get this as well? So this is his first motivation, uh, is that these people who are other Christians, they, gave, they got extreme joy from giving, and they, they gave even though they couldn't afford it. So he carries on. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in your love for us, and you've got all of these uh, gifts, see that you excel in this act of grace also. You've got the other ones. Don't miss out on having this gift. I'm not saying this as a command. Now, this is really important here. 
he's constantly saying, this is, you're not under compulsion. This is not a rule. I'm not giving you a tithing rule here that you've got to follow. This is free will. I'm not saying this is a command, but to weigh the sincerity of your love against the earnestness of the others. In other words, this is actually going to be a test of your love, and I, I think you're going to pass the weighing, but let's see. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though, though he was poor, yet for his sake he became so he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. So here's another motivation. What's the motivation in this verse? Jesus gave you, a, be like Jesus, be Christ-like. You know, Christ get, is a giver, be like him. So be like the Macedonians, be like Christ. Uh, don't let me down in my, my boasting of you. Um, and then he, he continues, um, Actually, I'm going to just skip over the whole lot here about the, in the box areas about how he's going to organize this and how it's all going to happen. So, verse 6 of chapter 9. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Ah, you might say, hey, look, give to get. That's what you told us was wrong with tithing. Um, you know, here's the mo motivation. Um, actually, he's not saying you're going to get back, you know, 10 times the money you put in, but you'll be blessed by giving. And, you know, that blessing might be spiritual. It may be financial. It may be. And I have seen God give financially to pe people who have given. And so God can do that. But that's not the point. The point is whatever God you need God will richly bless you and abundantly bless you, and it may be blessings in heaven. So there still is that principle that God is no one's debtor. <clears throat> then, but verse 7, really important. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So really clear there. Isn't that clear? Like, how can we have, you know, a percent rule if God wants it to be done freely? And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So there's not going to be a loss from doing this. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seeds for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So what's going on there? It's the same idea that, <clears throat> that you'll be blessed by giving. That is not something you'll, be, you'll lose out. You'll be blessed by giving in every way. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just talking about your needs being met. Here he says um, it will produce thanksgiving to God. And here it talks about overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. And I'm going to come back to this later, but really this is talking about it being an act of praise to God, praise and thanksgiving to be giving to him. Um, now, just a, a matter that I just referred to about when it's to be collected, he tells them that they are to lay this aside on the first day of the week. Uh, every each week, so that they're not, they don't have to. He doesn't have to collect everything when he comes, but they collect it together on the first day of the week, a bit, you know, a bit at a time. And what this is, this is really interesting because we know that the early church met on Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. They met on a Sunday, and this is one of the few places in the Bible where we actually get uh, evidence of the fact that they make their, that was their regular time of meeting because this is when they would be giving. The other thing that's interesting is that it's reflecting on it being an activity they would do together. It wasn't an individual thing, but it was like a corporate giving time, an activity doing it together, and that's really interesting. 
so this is actually important as well as we come on to the practicalities of it. But it's also useful. We know, we know they called it the Lord's Day, and there's a few references to the Lord's Day. We know that John wrote Revelation. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. But that's really a, a, a different sermon. That's an aside. But uh, what I'd like to do then is to ask the question, what then does this leave us with as principles for giving in the New Testament? Well, first of all, the motivation for receiving that back does seem to be valid. It's okay to give and want to receive something back, but, the pri- but, but it primarily could be treasure in heaven, or it could be giving, receiving joy or other things. It's not like a financial thing. You give, you give this much and you'll get this much back. You know, you're, it's not that kind of thing that is often portrayed today. Um, one of the things that I think is really important about uh, um, the act of giving to God today, and actually in the Old Covenant, but particularly today, is it is an act of praise and worship to God. And uh, this is, um, it's kind of, nowadays we don't tend to give with cash, but when there was the old cash, you know, bag went round and we used to pass the bag round here, then it's, look, we can do that during a time in the, in the meeting where we dedicate that and we pray to God, Lord, we've given this to you. And we're going to try and see what we can do to try and, try and bring that moment back, because I think it should be part of our worship. And there's um, a verse in in um, Revelation, even in in Revelation, this is um, seen. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now, it's not that they're tithing with their crown. They've got ten and they're giving one to God. It's, uh, I'm sure they'll get their crowns back afterwards. That's not the whole point. The point is it's an act of worship to give your golden crown to God, to, to cast it down before him. And it's like picturing this as symbolic worship here. And as we're praising God, we are giving a gift as part of our praise. Could we say, you are worthy to receive glory glory and honor and power, and here I'm giving you this right now. So it very much that is part of it. But a question we're going to come up with, which is, which is kind of core to this sermon I'm giving, is how much should I give? How much should I give? If, if God gave us a figure, then it wouldn't be free will anymore. If I told you I've had a revelation, it's actually 12.5% that we, he's to, we're to give, then well, it's no longer free will. And so it, it spoils the whole thing. Um, but we can come up with some principles. And one of the principles is comparing the old covenant to the new. And one of the best books in the Bible for comparing the old and the new covenants is Hebrews. And in Hebrews 8, I'm just going to read just a little bit. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For this is the covenant that I will make. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their people and they shall be my God. So I will be their God and they shall be my people. <laughs> Sorry, get that right. <laughs> Glad somebody's awake. I'm just testing you. <laughs> so um, uh, what's it saying here? The new is superior to the old. It's better. So this is the law. The law in the old was written on, uh, written out. Um, in the new, it's written on our hearts. So here's the golden question. Do we give more under the new or under the old? If under the old you were to give 10% because the law was written there in stone, are we to give more in the new? Or in the... In the uh, so I think it... The very minimum we must say that that under the new, if we're giving less than under the old, then there's something wrong there. And so uh, I would su- suggest practically, and this is not just me saying, if many people say this, that it's a good starting point to say 
It's a good, it's a free will thing, you're not being commanded to, but it's a good starting point, and this is what it's based on. That if under the old, I was to give 10%, and I'm, I mean, I could start arguing it's 23%, but let's stay with the 10 for now. Um, if under the old, I was to give 10%, then um, surely, with God's spirit on my heart, under the new, I should be free willing to give uh, at least 10%. And I think that's a great place to start as a, as a practical suggestion, and this is my basis for it. So I want to summarize this then and bring this all together, and this is my last slide. Receiving back is a valid motivation for giving, except it is primarily treasure in heaven. So I want to say, yes, it's okay to 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 know you're going to get something back. Be motivated, though, by God's joy over you when you give cheerfully. And this is one of the things Paul talked about in the um, passage we read. You know, God's joy over the cheerful giver. He loves it. It it's, brings a joy to him. Another motivation is that it's an act of worship. It is a way that you can lift God up and you can worship him as you do this. And so uh, there, are, um, there are some other motives that are given in the, in the passage that we were reading and that um, there are, it's, it's a way we can grow, it's a way we can experience more of God, it's a way that we can develop this relationship with God as we give and often his grace that he gives us back is maybe he'll give us spiritual gifts, maybe he'll give us bring people into our lives who are blessings. It's not just numeric funds coming back as, as that he gives us as motivation. All kinds of richness in our lives as we do this in this act of worship. And then I would conclude by saying it should be at least as much as under Old Testament law. And um, for those who say, well, I, you know, I just don't have any spare, then I think that it does apply when there's teaching about you know, God is no one's debtor. God will supply all your needs. Trust the Lord, he will supply your needs. So this is a, I must confess, this has not been an, an easy subject to prepare. And so I really wanted to make sure that I brought you all the, all the biblical basis. It wasn't just me spouting it off, but I'm giving you the best biblical basis I can. Um, is there, just briefly, is there any questions? Yeah? Absolutely. If you give more grudgingly, it's broken. Yeah, no, you're right. Thank you for that. Yes. Right. So, so that giving to the poor. So that is a very good um, question. Um, what happened in the New Testament church is they would actually give to the church. To start off with, it was to the apostles, and they and it became too much of a burden. And the whole system of deacons was set up for dispersing funds to the poor. And so, um, and that was, um, that whole system was set up. And so, uh, of course, it's fine to give to people directly. It's fine to. But um, that, there's more protection against abuse if, it, if there's some sort of process that's set up. And um, uh, we know that in the, the church in Acts, they had all things in common. They would, like, take people into their houses. There was, there was eating together. And so... A lot of things were done directly, um, and um, so I, I think that 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 is that is in addition to the other kinds of, of needs of giving. But but what Paul is asking for in the Second Corinthians passage is actually for physical needs ultimately. But it's going through the church. That's a, yeah. Thank you for that. Anything else? Yeah. Being transparent, I think, I think that's important, yes, because um, to avoid corruption, and um, we do have, um, uh, thankfully, in Canada, to be a charity, you, are, you, you can be, you know, all your books have to be available to the government, and you can be um, audited and so on. But in many places, even then, there are, there's corruption happens. And in many places in the world, there's corruption that happens, sadly. The Church of God has not been immune from horrible corruption. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Yes. <laughs> One more and we're, and we're done. Yes. The question is, why do we still do communion then? I mean, the breaking of bread, which is, you know, pre-law. For breaking of bread, Jesus deliberately replaced the Passover with this. During a Passover meal, he said, the, this is the new covenant in my blood. By do this, do this to rem in remembrance of me. And he instituted this during a Passover meal. And this, the, the, in the, old, the Passover was about bl the blood of the lamb. And he's basically saying, I am the lamb, and now we're symbolizing it with wine. And in, instead of having the, the, uh, the, the broken lamb's body, we're breaking bread and we're going to do this. And it's like turning into a feast of joy, looking forward to feasting with him. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's the replacement for the Passover, yeah. Good. Okay, well, let me, let me just close in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible generosity to us. And Lord, we pray that you would help each, give each one of us this grace that you gave to the Macedonians, this grace of giving, this grace of joy, this grace of, of just being able to, to trust you with what we have and give it to you and just be full of joy in receiving what you, what you give to us. Lord, give us this grace, we pray. Help each one of us to be a cheerful giver. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, you'll give us clearer revelation of all of these things as we ask them of you. In Jesus' name, amen.